Hello and welcome. Welcome to this session of Horn Camp Connect. Uh, I am your host, Nikki Labonte, the Assistant Artistic Director of Kendall Betts Horn Camp. Thank you for coming back to day five. I am here with our very special guest, Peter Currell, who is the former principal horn of the Rochester Philharmonic, current horn professor at the Eastman School of Music, and all around great person and horn player. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you being here. Applause, applause, applause. Yes, yes, yes. Another reason that I've asked uh, Professor Corral to be here today is because in addition to all of your horn playing qualifications, you also own and care for a relatively large amount of cats. And you also have a relatively large amount of experience dealing with the horn studio. And I thought maybe those things would have some similarities in between them. How you care for and round up your cats every day would have something to do with how you care for and round up your students every day. I can see the similarities there. Yes. Yeah, there are some very parallel analogies. Yeah, we will explore those. Yes, absolutely. So I wanted to talk a little bit about first how you obtain, how you recruit your studio, how you choose who comes in. You know, everybody watching here, if you're a horn player, will have to teach at some point or another. Um, if you play the horn, you'll have to teach. And so even if you're not teaching at a collegiate institution, it's important to know um tips on on building a studio and building a healthy studio mm -hmm. so how do you start out by by choosing people by finding people who um, you think would fit well within your model well you know since you as you well know from personal experience you got into the studio and that was just pure serendipity right just just complete luck of the <laughs> right. draw you right. know when that happened of and, course and it's true i you know i admit i make mistakes from time to time <laughs> um <laughs> But, Ouch. Okay. <laughs> but the, um, the way I view it is that uh, I have the great privilege of teaching at the Eastman School of Music. And there are numerous assets available to students that are enrolled at the Eastman School of Music, which range from very good concert halls, right? Legendary halls in some cases, to um, arguably the best academic music library in the United States. But um, I also view the horn studio culture as being an, an asset equal to those other assets. And so that provides, if it's carefully uh, curated and cultured, it provides a, a tremendous learning opportunity for the people that are enrolled in, this, in the school mm -hmm. as Horn students. So I do take careful consideration in deciding who we should invite to become members of that studio. Part of it is related, of course, to playing ability. Part of it is related to whether the applicants have um, major liabilities in their playing or minor liabilities in their playing that could be easily rectified. No one's perfect, so no one has to be like an absolute flawless applicant. But it's, you know, if it's, it involves a substantial amount of remediation, it's probably not the right school for you. But if it's a little tweaking here and there and just general overall development, you're still in the running. But um, my predecessor at Eastman School at the end of the day, when he was doing evaluations, this is I'm speaking of Vern Reynolds here, that he would uh, evaluate the audition. He would probably play a couple notes on the piano and ask the, the student to match them to check intonation. He would check, as I do, academic transcripts, GPA, SATs, stuff like that. Um, of course, evaluate the audition itself. His final question in the process was, do you want to see that student at 430 on a Friday? Because you're going to have that chance to do so. <clears throat> if it's somebody you want to work with, <clears throat> you're very happy to see them at 430 on a Friday. But that is a factor that he considered, and I do as well. But I also ask another question. Would this student be a good contributor to the studio? Would that student gain a lot from being in the studio? And would they give a lot to their colleagues in the studio? So that is that is a, a very serious consideration that I weigh in determining who to suggest for admission. I want to touch again on something that you said there, which was um, GPA. Uh, Eastman is a conservatory, and there are some academic components. But why factor in GPA if it's not if it's not something that they might be using? You're not you're using a lot of the like. GPA knowledge, the math, science, all of those things? Well, um, first of all, Eastman likes to bill itself appropriate so as a comprehensive music school. It's part of the University of Rochester, which is has very high academic standards. Um, 
it's true. What you say is true that that chances are those people that are going to be pursuing, let's say, performing careers on horn probably don't need to know calculus or trigonometry. But um, in looking at a, a GPA uh, report, I'm assessing to some extent, not whether they have knowledge of that subject matter, which I've most of which I've forgotten, by the way, personally. Um, but basically, do they have the discipline to, to you know, get through these academic courses? Because, I mean, look, in life, are we always going to be doing only stuff that we like to do? No, you're going to be doing stuff that you have to do. And so if they're not really tuned in to, let's say, Canadian history, um, and this is actually a true story, but I'm not going to reveal names. If they're not tuned into Canadian <laughs> history and they and they, you know, they do a, a bad job in Canadian history, are they going to do a good job in a writing seminar at the Eastman School, which is required? Are they going to do a good job and, and stay above boards on a humanities course? To me, it's a matter of just discipline, academic discipline, more than academic rigor. I don't really care whether they know the subject matter. I just want to know whether they can make it through those courses if it's not really their cup of tea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a really good point. I had the advantage of you know the Florida education system, which I'm sure you know. I learned a lot about alligators and a lot about alligator trivia, and so I was really good at that thing. And mm -hmm. fortunately, that I think really carried me into the school. I think so too. Yeah, they didn't ban any books in your era, did they? <laughs> and we're moving on. <laughs> so, Cole, uh, let's talk. You mentioned that the asset of uh, Eastman Studio culture. Um, what do you mean about culture? in the studio well you know frankly we're here at kendall betts camp which has a fantastic if you will studio culture there's a sense of mutual respect there's a sense of support everybody's sort of cheering each other on any kind of suggestions are offered in a very positive way it's not critical it's not punitive we're looking for that kind of a culture in this in the eastman studio as well uh, when we do studio classes for example students will play <clears throat> and then we'll open up the floor for comments and the general protocol, which we've established, is that um, comments that are coming <clears throat> to be directed to the students need to be first three positive accolades, three compliments. You did this well, boy, I really liked the way you did that. This was awesome. And then you can slip in one suggestion, not a criticism, a suggestion. And that proportion is deliberate, three to one because any kind of, of a suggestion has the potential of being viewed with a great deal of negative potency. It carries more weight than the positive ones. Mm -hmm. Not that it should. It seems to be this is the way people are hardwired. Even in a private lesson, someone will play, say, what'd you think of that? It's just a very benign inquiry on my part. What did you think of that? I'm not saying, what did you do wrong? What did you think of that? And immediately they start just, laying into the stuff that they did wrong. I don't know where they pick this up, but they pick it up well before they get to college. And I think it goes back maybe to, you know, let's say middle school band or something. I don't know. So we try to break that, that, um, that re regime. And so that we do try to skew it in a manner so that we start with the positive stuff. We start with the accolades. And then when we're going to make an observation or a suggestion for further improvement, we pitch it in a way that's inspiring that they feel challenged to try to implement it. Mm -hmm. What what do you do, you know, if there is a, a big issue that a student needs to address and sometimes you'll have to be a little more direct and forward about that. How do you approach that subject? So what kind of a, an issue would you say? You know, it could be anything from, you know, a personality issue or something like that, or just a, a playing issue that that you think the student is not paying attention to or you feel like you've said the same thing over and over again. I know that's definitely not something that uh, you've experienced with me because I listen on the first time and okay. I've always well, responded really positively to feedback. I think I get, I get, I get where you're coming on this. So, <laughs> so um, are you familiar with Roger's thesaurus? I can't say did that they, I am actually. Did they have that in Florida when you were growing I, up? Uh, I probably just read an alligator book instead. Yeah, I mean, essentially <laughs> it's, it's, it's a book of synonyms. Okay. So um, I do know what a thesaurus is. I just didn't know that specific brand. I think that's the guy that, that compiled it. Okay, got okay. it. So this will probably be a shock to you. 
Okay, and, ready. and maybe to you guys too, uh, watching on, on the web. I've been known to have to say the same thing over and over and over again. What? Yeah, I mean, I know it's it's it's, it's like it's probably it's my it's my failures, right? Yeah. You know, when I when I make a comment. I don't quite have it succinct enough, or it's not quite direct enough, or it's not quite relevant enough to for it to hit home and get the results I want. Mm -hmm. So occasionally, I have to like dig deeper into my vocabulary and try to say essentially the same thing a different way. Mm -hmm. That's where the thesaurus thing comes in. Right. Okay. I'll often like string together three or four or five synonyms in a row in order to hope that maybe one of them will hit pay dirt. Got it. Okay. But I've, I've gotten rather patient at this, mm. you know, so I, 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 I never really give up. Okay? I never throw in the towel on this, this stuff, but I do try occasionally to go at it through a back door instead of a front door. Got it. How do you accumulate all of those other than just reading the thesaurus? How do you accumulate all of those alternate ways of explaining a problem? Is that just through experience? Is that through trial and error? Is that through figuring out what works for certain students? I think it's um, well, first of all, I've been in the teaching saddle for a while, right, you know, so I've had the benefit of, of getting paid to have that experience, right, which is good. Um, but um, a lot of what I'm trying to impart to my students, I've attempted to impart to myself as well. Mm. And as you well know, and I'm sure you readily readily will admit and want to try to publicize as, as much as possible. I've been around the block a few times. I mean, look at me, right? So I've had plenty. I've had plenty of, of experience trying to teach myself. Yeah. You know, what I need a little more work on with regard to myself is a little bit more skewing in terms of the positive stuff rather than the negative stuff. Right. But, but anyway, in, in terms of the verbiage, I can usually try to figure things out and try to apply it to myself, which then hopefully I remember and find a way to package it so it would be effective for a given student mm -hmm. and what I might say to one student may not be able to be said in the same manner to the next student it's got to be you know cultured a little bit differently right how do you sort out um disagreements among students I mean you know especially I think in any age group there's always going to be personalities that clash especially I think in high school middle school or college there's a lot of um, character development that I think happens within that stage of life. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think I was a fully developed and competent human right from the get-go. Absolutely but, true. Yeah, yeah. But, right. But I think that yeah. there is always. I have I've never In really. Terms, had well, to if grow. you look at dictionary, I know you don't know what thesaurus is. We've already discussed <laughs> I do that, know but, what a thesaurus is. But do you know you know the word dictionary? I do know yeah, what the so word dictionary. So if you look under dictionary, on competent. Competent, well-developed individuals. Your picture is there. It better be. Yeah. I've paid a lot of money for that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so in that case, you know, how do you, if, if you feel like there's a, a disagreement between students or something, mm -hmm. how do you sort that out in a way before it infects? For That's lack a of good a better point. Word, That's a good before point. Before it Nikki. infects the rest of the. You're student. on. You're on a roll today, Nikki. Thank I'm, you. I'm really. I'm really proud of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, so it's, it's only a little after nine o'clock Eastern time, and you're, and you're really firing on all cylinders. This is the three compliments before he gives me a sharp <laughs> yeah. criticism right after. Okay. This. <laughs> so, in, in response to your question, and I don't mean this in a, in a, a disrespectful way, I do my best to remain oblivious to this stuff. Right, and okay? you do a very good job. <laughs> Thank you. Because, <laughs> I mean, I, I honestly want to try to treat my relationship with the students in a more professional way so that I'm, I'm interested in their horn playing and their musicianship and their sense of artistry. Mm -hmm. I actually try to distance myself from their, their whatever their social inclinations are. Mm -hmm. So this this is not the thing. This is not what I'm interested in. I don't want to get involved in that. I don't want to know, you know, what's going on, on on that front. Other people that they associate with are going to be privy to that. I actually don't want to know it and I don't seek it out. However, sometimes it seeks me out, right? It sort of comes to me if it, it ends up showing up on my desk. And so we can start, you know, on a one-to-one -one discussion with, you know, let's say a couple of kids that are having some sort of a rivalry or dispute. I'll talk to each one of them individually to try to get their their feedback, and then I'm I'm willing to mediate it if if need be. Mm -hmm. But usually, when I find out a given student's perspective on that particular issue, the example we're citing, 
and the other student's perspective on it, we can find some ways for each of them to modify their behavior a little bit to sort of reconcile that. Um, so that's like low level intervention. Yeah. But the Eastman School and the University of Rochester, there's all sorts of escalating levels of intervention in order to try to, to ad address the situation. So if it, it doesn't get solved at my level, at the studio level, then you can move it up to like residential dean level, you can move it up to a little bit higher level in the administration. So they would actually, they actually have like, you know, trained staff members and stuff that, mm -hmm. that would do this. And despite years and years of practice, I'm actually not a licensed counselor. Wow. I know, I hate to admit it, I'm not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist. I'm an unlicensed one, mm -hmm. but I'm not licensed. But there are people in the administration and in the, you know, the University Health Service who in fact are trained in that. That's their gig, mm -hmm. they're licensed. So they may end up getting involved in it if, if need be. Rarely is the case that they have to be though. Yeah. It usually gets resolved well before that. Let's but, talk but it is true yeah. that, that that kind of a thing can pollute the environment within mm -hmm. the studio right and you end up you know there's usually some sort of factionalism that develops if it's not sort of nipped in the bud and, and addressed yeah we have an advantage at eastman in that which is was not the case when i was a student there uh back in the dark ages this is like when gutenberg invented the printing press yeah like yeah. the 1600s <clears throat> exactly okay so um because there were uh, multiple studios multiple horn studios right. at, least, at least two and I don't know how much interaction there was among those students from one studio to the other, but there was a, a little bit of a rivalry between those those teachers. Mm -hmm. And uh, some schools, you know, of course, they have you know three or four horn studio horn teachers. Yep. Uh, Eastman, I'm, I'm the have the benefit of being the main guy, and we we hire out a couple adjuncts to do some of the teaching, but on a, a rotating basis, so that a student that might be starting with uh, an adjunct for that week, they're back with me the following week. Mm -hmm. Same thing with our other adjunct uh, professor. So no one ever feels like they're sequestered, you know, and, and removed from the, the inner workings of the, the main, the, the horn studio, the mm -hmm. one horn studio. Yeah. That's good for, for interest, interest studio rapport. Yeah. You mentioned the, that you're not a, a licensed counselor, but you do a really great job of it. But how don't, do don't you- Don't patronize me, Nikki. I would never. Yeah. I'm just giving you the three compliments before I give you a harsh Okay, criticism. here it comes, I'm ready. No, <laughs> but I did wanna ask you about how, how do you gauge what level of response to an issue in a lesson or something would affect a student the best? When do you, you know, I, I think sometimes when I'm teaching, it's a, it can be a difficult balance to figure out what that student needs to hear at that moment. Does it need to be a gentler message or is there a time to really like, you know, uh, be forceful and, and be um, straightforward about the problem? How do you go about gauging that and figuring out what the student would respond well to? Um, is there something that people can do to sort of figure that out ahead of time without just pure experience? Or is it just a spur of the moment decision? I, I think, first of all, my, my general inclination is to never like, you know, lower the hammer on them. Right. Right. I, I know some teachers, it's just it's just kind of cut and dry. You know, it's, it's this way or the highway. But I, I personally I don't operate effectively that way. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I can be direct. And I can say, you know, this is what you sound like. This is why you sound this way. This is what you should sound like. This is how you do that. Mm -hmm. You know, but in terms of just like, you know, dropping the, the hammer on them, I don't think they, most kids don't respond to that. Mm -hmm. And and secondly, in the, with the same student, one approach one week might be more successful than an approach the next week. Right. You have to kind of gauge where they are emotionally and, and also their, their level of preparation or non-preparation on a given week. Are there cues you use to gauge that? Tears usually are a good sign. Tears, okay. Yeah, you know, how, how many times- Tears are a good sign? Is that well, what you a, meant? Well, it's a sign okay. of how to gauge it. Okay, got it. <laughs> yeah, or how many times they reach for a Kleenex, you know, for example, yeah. which doesn't happen very often. Right, of actually. course, of course, of course. Um, do you find that, I think sometimes for every teacher, for everybody who's taught, there are some lessons that I think become less about horn lessons and more about a session to talk about something else that's going wrong. I know that that's something that 
we are not licensed to do, but it's something that happens a lot because the student is not in a place to engage with the horn that week. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you address that? How do you navigate that so that the horn lesson, you know, that you're you're responding to what the student needs, but the horn lessons don't just evolve into a weekly therapy session? Well, as you well know, um, I've got some magnets and stuff up on my file file drawer uh, yes. in my office. If you've I ever mean, been you, to the Eastman studio, yeah. it is a mess. It's a mess. It's a mess. <laughs> Um, there's an Einstein quote, which I won't cite, but they're related to that. Anyway, okay. <laughs> um, so if you look deep enough, you'll find these magnets. And there's one that is a quotation from Buddha. Now, I'm not trying to espouse Buddhism, but I do like this quote. All that we are is the result of what we think. What we think we become. The mind is everything. So when a student comes in and you can sense there's some emotional baggage there, it's you, you have to deal with that first because that is having a negative impact on their performance on the horn. You can't just ignore it and say, let's work on horn play. It's their they're, they're, they're playing is compromised because their head is in the wrong place for yeah. whatever reason. So, you know, fix the problem. Don't put a band aid on it and ignore it. Go after the problem if they're willing to talk about it. If they don't want to talk about it, then you can refer refer them to these, you know, these, these trained counselors who are experienced at, at listening and soliciting and eliciting, you know, their, these, these folks feelings, but you know, that's the issue They you can't, they can't play well and trying to make them play well or better when they've, they're carrying this emotional baggage is, is kind of a, a waste of time, mm -hmm. fix the emotional baggage. And then all of a sudden they're going to play with a greater degree of liberation and be more receptive to, suggestions and comments you might make. Hmm. We're getting close to the end of time. Is there anything relating to studio culture, relating to cat care and cat culture, hearkening back to our herding cats thing that I missed, that I didn't ask about, that you think is, is critical to fostering a healthy and productive studio environment? Yeah, well, I think you, you build this as herding cats or something, herding uh -huh. kittens, something yeah, like did. that. Yeah. yeah which is challenging, okay? And so um, fortunately we have no kittens anymore, but my wife and I, but well, obviously they were kittens, right? But uh, you know, this will probably, you know, burn up the internet, but we have 11 cats that live on our front porch and garage. We get two meals, two square meals a day. And we have now three cats in our basement and three cats upstairs. And our numbers are down, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is a little Just low through, number through for attrition, you. sad to say. <laughs> but, you know, trying to, trying to herd cats in general is, is tough, and trying to herd kittens is even worse, which is, of course, interesting to, to, to reflect upon the fact that some of the, the most renowned, in the most negative sense, renowned dictators of the world, like Alexander the Great, for example, mm -hmm. and Genghis Khan, and maybe Hitler. They never had cats ah. because they couldn't control them. Mm. They couldn't control the cats. So it was like it rubbed against them, you see? Yeah. So in terms of herding cats, we, we talked a little bit about this back in Rochester. It's kind of like putting bumpers up on, on a bowling alley. So when you have kids, little kids that are trying to learn how to bowl, you put up these bumpers. So they, it keeps the ball from going in the gutter. And so there's a sense of, of great accomplishment and pot is reinforcement that comes out of knocking some pins down mm -hmm. successfully. So to some extent with the students, you're trying to put up some bumpers there so that they achieve the success they're, they're striving for and they get the sense of gratification from the improvement. But you have to also recognize, we talked earlier about the various assets of education at available at Eastman School, the concert halls, the library, the culture in the studio, et cetera. Another asset that is, it is important for every school is to allow failure. Mm -hmm. You have to allow the students to fail. They must fail so they can learn from that. You can't just have it set it up so that they only have success after success after success, because guess what? Life is not like that. The profession is not like that. 
you have to be able to fail and be able to pick yourself up and keep going. So at some point on our little analogy here, you got to take some of those those bumpers on the bowling alley down. But what you want to watch is you want them to fail. You don't want it to be like irreversibly bad. So you have to sort of assess what degree of failure is going to be good for them. And would their failure have any negative impact on their colleagues? If so, you intervene. But if it's just going to be a little bit of a transgression from which they will learn something, it's tough, but you have to kind of like stand by, watch it transpire, and then bring it up and discuss it and say, what'd you learn from that? Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really nice way to end this. I think that that's a really important thing. And um, I know that anybody in this profession has failed a lot and it's important to learn how to do that in a positive way. So thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you, you all for joining us. Thank you to our live studio audience. You were great, very supportive. I loved it. Uh, please join us again tomorrow morning. We'll be doing a session with Pat and James on musicality. So that should be really fun. A nice way to start your day. Thank you again for tuning in. We really appreciated having you. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.